like our, our temporary restaurant, if you like. We've been having breakfast, lunch, and dinner in there for the last seven days or so while we've been building the site. And then through here, E1 offices, that's uh, where we're doing all of our admin, all of our planning, scheduling, all of that kind of stuff. And then various different tents here that are set up for different suppliers and teams across the event site. And you'll see from about 6 p.m. tonight when we shut this down, this entire site gets dismantled and then off onto the ship for the next race around the world to Saudi Arabia for the beginning of season three. Uh, so, like key one staff has got just under 40 full time personnel. And then across an event site, there's, depending on the scale of the event, 250 to 300 people on site. So, 40 plus the 250 exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I'll take you through this way, we're going to four parts. So in here we've got multiple different crews and teams and they're all doing slightly different functions across the production of four parts for you one. The back corner on the left here, this is our augmented reality graphics team. So when you're watching the live feed in the media center, you see where we inserted billboards and for our partners and the graphics to show where the boats are moving around the race. That's all being produced by these guys here. So they use Unreal Engine to create a complete 3D replica of the race course and the environment. They built the city skyscapes, all the skyscrapers, the boats and cruise ships and all that kind of stuff. And then that supports the uh, editor and the producer in our one and being able to contextualize the race and tell what's going on, who's on a short lap, a long lap, all of those kinds of things help bring the narrative to life and make it easier for the fans watching at home to understand. Also, from my point of view, in my commercial role, it allows me to stitch in the part of content that we need and the branding exposure on the broadcast without having to bring in hundreds of tons of branding and put that up physically on site. So it helps us from a sustainability point of view, but it also means we can chop and change things when we see camera angles that are getting better pick up. We can adapt that live in real time and move branding around on that to maximize exposure for our market. Is that how you're getting the game, gaming of track? Exactly. 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 And then what we've done with them with that team sit is they built the simulators that we're seeing on the site So you can jump into the sim and hide the race of the Exactly on my own course, just to see it on the path. Yeah. And the, the sort of hyper realism of it is quite astonishing now. Yeah. Yeah. We could almost do the entire TV show just in AR and camera on And then moving down here, these guys are looking after what we call the RF cameras, radio frequency cameras. So those are the oh, traditional yeah. broadcast cameras you'd see at like an NBA or an NFL game. Um, so they're positioned around the shore, and then we also have a camera boat that is out on the water with a stabilized camera that's doing that. That's the audio. You have an audio feed stationed around yeah. microphones all around yeah. the boat. Yeah. Yeah. So that's picking up all the ambient noise of contact and waves breaking and all that kind of stuff. And then it gets piped into the video. So then here we're doing a lot of mixing and production of those shots as well. This crew here, this is my favourite yeah. <laughs> I, I took a whole load of kids through here yesterday and they love this bit. Um, so you'll see on top of the boat, behind the pilot's cockpit, is a black camera. I saw that. We were at one here actually. It looks a little bit like RTV mm -hmm. So that is a 360 degree remote control camera. And this team here from Foster, you see the they have full control of all the cameras. And that's a big thing that's really helped us not just tell a story of racing in E1, but they were to come up with the infrastructure. Since we can pivot these cameras on board the boats, we can pan around and look at two boats coming into a corner together. Now, did you pick up that, that, that crash that kind of just happened? Yeah, we did. Yeah, that. I saw that on the replay. Yeah, so that was part of this. Uh, well, there's two different onboard solutions. Yeah. There's two 60 Agile mounted on the roof. Yeah. And then there are, you can see on this screen here, you've got this top one here. You've got a cockpit on board looking back at the pilot. And then you've got four different shots on each race bird looking back towards the foils or looking forward over the bow. So again, we can cut between all of those shots. And then once we package all of that up, we go through this enormous server here, which is probably the most important thing on site. We've got to keep full and all the way through. So this is 
this is the extent of the broadcast compound that you want to do. If you went to another international sport, the broadcast compound could be 1,500, 2,000 people. The way we can keep this alive is we do remote production. This server is then connected back to our production facility in the UK, and then we have our editors, our commentators, and all of the production around the show sat remote in the UK in real time, mixing shows together. And so that means we can keep a lighter footprint, better sustainability for a tiny, tiny little bit of latency, but you need that on a live feed anyway, so it tends to build in like 30 seconds of the live feed, right? So it, it works in our favor. Right. How much of volume do you have then? Uh, that is a great question I don't know the answer to, but where we're going next, the guy in there might be able to answer the problem. So we head out of here and take a right. Is this server running? I know you guys talk about sustainability a lot. Is this just like a generator? It's running on event power. Uh, and event power is always a challenge for us. So where we can, we want to be a sustainable power. So whether that's uh, like a grid technology work for us, or where we don't have access to the grid in locations like this, ideally we want to bring in the most sustainable power solution possible. So various races have brought in battery energy storage, so that's a charge brought to the site and has all the power that we need and we really want to have run things on the side. It's, it's part of the purpose and the challenge and the opportunity of these ones as we travel the way that the, the availability of those sustainable solutions is different. Uh, so yeah, we can't find one out of the perfect situation. Sometimes we have generators, we're going to try and make sure we've got more HPA, which is the carbon neutral on this side. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, the sustainability of the carbon storage. So for this race, you said it doesn't matter as far? No, I, th I believe this race is generation switch. We can head out this way and take a look. So literally the entire event site is packed up into this and that's all managed by Kuna Nagel, who are our logistics partner. Question. Yeah. The black race crew. Yeah. So that's not a branded bird. Yeah. They put that out there as a replacement? No, we were just running some testing on it. So we carry uh, full set spares, including fully operational boats. We've had some issues with some teams this weekend with small boats, yeah. Team Miami particularly. So we were just running some systems checks on the final spare, so that if we need it today for other accident damage, we know the boat's operational. So. Okay. All right. So we'll head down this way into race control. There's some tech inside those booths? Yeah, there are. So where we are now is race control. So this is where we do the governance of the sport, where everything is adjudicated and reviewed by martial arts, safety officials, and all that sort of stuff. So the boys I showed you outside, those are autonomous GPS boys. So it's like a drone on water, effectively. The reason that's really important is that GPS positioning in those buoys means we always know the race course is exactly accurate. So there's no drift in the current or wind conditions or time. That mark for turn one is always in the same position every single session, Friday, Saturday, whatever we do. And that's what we control here through our Alcanel team. So Alcanel are responsible for all the timing of the events. So they then use those GPS coordinates reference the racetrack and understand where boats are and what they're doing. Are they on a long lap, a short lap, a regular lap? Have they jumped the start? Have they hit the start time? So you may have seen in some of the races today, we have quite a unique start procedure where we, there is announced a time for the race to start. So let's say race start at 11 a.m. The boats will leave the launch zone and go to a milling area, which is some way down this canal here. And then it's up to each pilot individually to decide when they leave the minute zone to cross the start line at exactly 11 a.m. And if they get that judgment wrong, they're either late and behind their competitors or they jump the start, the team in here will apply a penalty for them. What's going on with the penalty? It really depends on what the infraction is. So if we're talking about a jump the start, we normally do add an extra one back So the six lap race, like you'll see today, boat has to take a short lap, a long lap, and then four regular laps. So if they jump the start, they have got two long laps. So they're, they're then incurring time and time to drive their distance. So out of another line, one single source of truth, like everything is happening on the race floor. And then that DVD is done front of the other. 
right down the road. My own governing body in power in Brexit. So they define the rules for E1, and they're here in the floor. They the shape of those rules. So things like jump start, one back, and the Then the crew behind there for E1 are going to control. So they're in charge of the entire site. So they're not just how racing works and what time cranes are moving, when the boats push back, and race starts, and all that kind of stuff. But also the entire security of everyone on site. That's all managed there. When we come back to the third row, on the left hand side, Seabird engineers. So Seabird are responsible for the build and construction of all of the race birds that are racing on the water. They have oversight of all the data on every single boat. So they're there looking at state charge, battery temperatures, power cycles to make sure that the boats are operating within the prescribed window. Um, then on the right hand side of that desk are more of our production crew from the You can see on the iPad they're on a sort of live link back to the broadcast centre. And just feeding into the commentary team decisions that are taken in the So if there is a long lap penalty, you hear about it here first, and then they're informing the content to see the right information live on that. Um, and then right back here, uh, a little bit more from the situation to how the government is in control. So really, this is where all the controversy happens. The pilots, the, the engineers, the team principal are just outside of mission control, where we're going to take you in a minute. So the minute they want to protest something that's happened out in the water, they're running straight in here to come to the CIA. So we'll head out and I'll show you mission control. Yesterday, today, I think there's a different chart. There probably is, yeah. But I'm honest with you, I don't get to see any investigation. I don't know who's qualified where, I don't know what the times yesterday were or what the race times are today. But it wouldn't surprise me if you see the time difference today to today. Could they think if you run it better today yeah. than they were yesterday? Yeah. Because the start is trying to get this yeah. 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 Perfect. Yeah. 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 About this is like the pit lane equivalent from a motorsport series. So here, every team has their, their desk that's set up. So we start the Team Miami right in front of us, and all the way up to the left is not in the boat. And they're essentially the spotters of the pilot who's out on the water. So they're looking at where the competitors are, and they've got a boat coming alongside them into a turn, and they need to use the to cut into an apex to hold someone back, they're helping to give that perspective of what's happening around the pilot in real time. So they're all constant, they're all wearing headsets, they're talking to each other and live to the pilot in the boat. And you'll hear a broadcast throughout the day when they're picking up that radio from between an engineer and a pilot. And these guys sat here. They've always got a great view of the right hand side of the pilot. And we also have some of the back in supporting control, operation control, auto operation and so there. Where they're making all their strategy decisions. When in the race is the right time to go for that short lap? Are we in traffic? Do we want to delay it? What's going on around us? What are the other teams doing? Because the pilot out there doesn't know that the boat behind him is going to take a short lap. Yeah. Whereas his engineer here can see it from the broadcast. So it's not an order. I thought they, so they can take it when they want to. Absolutely at their discretion. But they have to have to click the, the, the number of them. They have to make sure they've done it by the end of the race. Yeah. But that's it. That's the only rule we yeah. apply them. So it creates all the strategy uncertainty yeah. of how you deploy those different plans across the race and how it works best for you depending on where you are in the plan, basically. How are you to set up uh, <laughs> Depends who. Uh, for me, it's here when I turn up, uh, which I'm very grateful for, but you know, operations crew are uh, here probably 10 days ahead of the event. You know, so yeah, we do, we do this for all our partners. We did some, some tours yesterday where we had an activation with PIF on the right before, so we brought the kids down yesterday. Yeah, I saw them. They all came out here for a tour. Which was, I mean, I'm not just saying this because I'm going to take that. It was probably the highlight of my day yesterday. Let's head back to the media centre because I definitely need some AC, but have yeah. you come really up front? Uh, we've, got a, we've got a really good idea, yeah. um, but not much to do with the calendar yet. Yeah, E1 operations here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mission control will be somewhere else, and race control will be all the way around. Um, and all of that is tied up in that kind of thing. So, in an ideal world, with the right promoter, the right funding, the right race site, we have acceleration festival, grandstand, and what? 
and you know, we can build all of that event infrastructure around us. So if you look at a lot of the events we're doing in the Middle East, particularly in Saudi Arabia and Qatar, we have the opportunity to build those sorts of infrastructure around the events. So Grace One is always in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, and there we have a full fan village built out. And this year we have 7,000 people in that fan zone for a few days. Um, and also a custom built on the infrastructure. Doha this year, nearly, probably just over 30,000 people on the Pearl, where we were racing, watching from the shore. Very cool. And that was, you know, an amazing event. Sorry, Doha. Doha. So, why is that now Angola built outside? It's just the complexity of this site. So, the, the space we've got here you know, we can build what we need for an ocean park and then to look at additional space for uh, sort of fan village and fan watching. We, it's permitting, it's all sorts of different parcels of land owned by different stakeholders, the complexity of it is too much for us. At this stage in our, in our sort of uh, infancy, yeah. this is only within 12 or 31, yeah. we're still out of start up school. It's definitely something that we need to address and we need to look at that. But also, to, be able to get the permission to come to Miami and hold our championship in our is, is too good to miss. Yeah, that felt that was good. They've done more sport racing in Miami, but it was over by Cuba's game to uh, yeah, uh, the Marine Stadium. They had Marine Stadium. Yeah. 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 Did you guys look at that as a location? I know it's been kind of worked out. Yeah, we did. Marine Stadium was the, was the initial site that we were going to go racing at, where we would get permission. Mm -hmm. We were closed off. You're out of the way of all the cruise ship movements. Yeah, so it's safe from the city's point of view. And we're, you know, we're, we recognize where we show up when I'm there. It's not like Formula One showing up in Miami and you know what they're going to put on again, right? Um, so that's that's where we got to originally. But then as we built the relationship with all the various different stakeholders around the city and the mayor's office, and they saw some of our events throughout the city and the world that we were going to the confidence built to a point where they felt comfortable to allow us to move closer into the city. Um, and again, you know, in an ideal world, we would stick with the site we chose and just stick to our plan. Yeah. But we're new, we're, we're happy to move quicker break in, so we have an opportunity to have a better backdrop and closer to the city and feel you know, a bit more iconic. So we, we roll with the punches and move on. Oh, we, we want to grow with you. How close is like the schedule for next year? It's, it's in really good shape. Um, I'd say probably a couple of weeks out from this race, we'll put an announcement out. There are, do, do you guys want to come through here? Yeah, sorry. so sorry. There are various kind of foundations we can build around. You know, we have long term agreements in Saudi Arabia with the Ministry of Sport and SWSDF. We know that that is always the season opener, and we know that's always going to be somewhere in January. So those dates are confirmed and locked in. Um, and we know that we want a finale to be in North America. And then that allows us to think about how we plan the freight schedule. We don't have to make anything. Yeah. We have to accommodate for shipping time and shipping movements and all the complexity around that. Which means we, we can then roughly split our calendar into thirds. Where we have a Middle East leg, a European leg, and then on to North America. And if that means we will buy a Africa or Caribbean, the races like I've seen in Lagos and Nigeria, you know? yeah. then that all fits quite nicely. I'm glad you yeah. said the Caribbean, the United yeah. States Virgin yeah. Islands. Yeah. Love to see you come down here. So would I. Yeah. So would I. I mean, beautiful space, yeah. uh, a lot of accommodation, friendly government, yeah. you know, so uh, yeah. maybe we can talk about that. They're, they're a comp I mean, there are so many exciting conversations. Yeah. I'd love to tell you about it. Yeah, yeah. And that's why we're just trying to take that time to get these kind of generation. Awesome. The other thing it's looking like going into 2026 is there'll be quite a lot of consistency. All the places we've been this year will return to. And I think that's a really important thing for us as a new 